What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode seven. We have my best friend, Jeremy Lin, today for the special episode seven. We are going to chat about some untold stories and just have fun with this this episode and just have a nice, is it called a fireside chat? I think it's called, I don't know if it's called a fireside chat, but uh, yeah, so hope you guys enjoy this episode. Jaywa, I call him Jaywa because his nickname is Jaywa Fan. It's like Joshua Fan, so I call him Jaywa. So when you hear that, that's what it's going to be. But I'm excited for this this uh, untold story episode. Um, so what do you have planned for us? All right, let's get it. So right now, NBA playoffs are going on. I thought it would be great to start off with recounting maybe some of your playoff experiences. I think we can first start off with, you know, I remember when you were uh, with Toronto, kind of the, especially in the finals, like the depth of detail and preparation that goes into preparing for some of these games. So I would like to ask you, what do you feel like, you know, the general population or outsiders don't really understand about the NBA playoffs and how much detail and preparation go into it? Yeah, so I'm going to, to give everybody context, um, a, a quick snapshot of me and Josh's relationship because that's going to tie into everything that I say. Um, we met when he was at Boston College and I was at Harvard. Um, and so he would train me for free. My freshman year, I put on 30 pounds. He taught me a lot. He would, and so I always told him, I was like, hey, uh, you know, this was 2006 when we met, 2006, 2007. And I said, if I ever get a contract, I'm going to hire you full time um, if I ever get a big payday. And so, you know, freshman year to, you know, four years later, my rookie year, Things are going well, and then all of a sudden, my second year is insanity, and I'm like, okay, I think I think I got my payday. Um, so I hired him as my full time trainer um, from 2012 until now. And during this whole time, Josh has Jaywa has moved with me from every city, every city. So you know, Houston, L.A., you know, Charlotte, also Atlanta, Toronto, all, Brooklyn, every single team I've been on. Beijing, he was assistant coach for the Beijing Ducks. Everywhere I've been, he's seen it up close and live. And so these stories are going to be pretty crazy. Um, but going back to your question, um, man, so whenever you get into the playoffs, the first thing he knows is when you're about to play your team, the, the, your opponent, doesn't matter what round it is. It's like, boom, textbook, this thick. Like, you go home with the textbook, and they're like, in two days when you come back, I want you to know that everything and, and this textbook has like every last statistic about their team each player their tendencies what plays they like to run out of timeout I mean it's so complex and so you're memorizing all this stuff and that is like just a snapshot into what the playoffs look like now your question going back to the finals and and, and even the eastern conference finals when I was with Toronto literally it was like okay, this is our coverage that we're going to use on Steph Curry or on Giannis. But then it's like the coverage depends on who else is on the floor. And so we would say like, okay, if Steph comes off a of pick and roll, we're going to double him, right? So we're going to force him to his left and we're going to double him. But then if Clay is in this corner, it's going to look a certain way. But if Clay is in the other corner, it's going to look a different way. If Clay is off the court, then it depends who's on the court. If Clay is off the court and Iggy's on the court, then we were going to do it like this. Or if Draymond's on the court or so and so. So literally, it was like you're not, you're factoring in like four, four different factors and you're figuring out like by the end, it's like, okay, we know we want to double Steph Curry. But then who helps off of Steph and how do we do the backside rotations? If you're not constantly communicating, you won't figure it out. And then not only that, every game, it's constantly evolving because this is chess. So they saw what we did in game three. So now they're making adjustments on game four. Now we have to counter their adjustments. And so, again, we know we're going to double Steph, but we don't know the rest of it, like, which direction are we forcing him? Who's helping off of where? And then after we, we help off of him, what are we looking for? If they swing it to this person, what are we doing? And it's like the most complex thing. And if you're not talking, 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 you'll get fried. Yeah. And I think one interesting thing I remember 
I think it was with the Lakers or another, another team, but like that you watch film at halftime. Like they already have all the clips cut up that you can kind of, and I think you mentioned like Kobe would watch all his clips. So like, can you talk more about the like halftime adjustments and like, what are you, do, I don't know, do, I, I don't think I've ever asked you, but did, were you watching clips of yourself? Like, and how did you kind of mentally take yourself to that process? And then, yeah, with the playoffs, like, what are those in-between days looking like with the level of preparation that you guys need to do? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the thing about basketball that the average fan does not understand is there are so many in-game adjustments, so many in-game adjustments. And when you prepare for a game, you've already worked through, like, this is plan A. If plan A doesn't work, we're going to go to plan B, plan C, and plan D, especially in the playoffs. Not only are we watching clips at halftime, we're watching clips on the bench. Like when we get subbed out or in timeouts, there's guys like literally their full-time jobs are to cut up these clips live, get them to you so that the next time you get in, it's almost like football when you see like Brady, okay, they just, you know, whatever, three and out, and then now they're on the sidelines and they're watching film. That's what we're doing. And, um, and, and, and so halftime for sure, you're watching a ton of clips, you're talking through adjustments, but literally if you wait until after the game to try to make your adjustments, like... <laughs> yeah, it's over for you. So you got to be on the fly. You got to be constantly figuring it out. And you think about it, it's like how many games come down to one possession, right? So like if we could change things and save two points or three points, that's the difference between one or winning one or two games in a series. And that's the difference between advancing or not. And... <laughs> You know, advancing or not is the difference between the entire coaching staff potentially getting fired or the entire coaching staff essentially winning a championship and becoming legendary. You know, it's like the margins are that small. Um, so it's like at that point, it's like no stone is unturned. Do you happen to remember any adjustments that like led to you guys blowing them out like the very next game and be like, dang, that was a, <laughs> that was a very important adjustment. Good call, whoever found that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, there was, you know, when we were playing the Milwaukee Bucks with the Toronto Raptors, we lost our first two games. We were down 2-0. And one of the things that we felt like we weren't doing well enough was we were letting Giannis, we were, we were just letting Giannis be too comfortable. The goal was Giannis, when he goes and drives past the three-point line, the minute he gets to the mid-range, you must cut him off within one dribble. Mm. If you don't cut him off within one dribble, we're in deep trouble because he's just too good. When he, the deeper he gets into the paint. And so one big adjustment that we made was the person guarding Giannis, I don't care what you do, cut him off within one dribble. What's he going to do? Every time Giannis gets cut off, what does he do? He spins. So we knew he was spinning. And so we would say, when he spins... The first two games, we were trying to get there, but we were too late. And so the third game, we were like, I swear, you know, Nick Nurse, Coach Nurse was like, if he spins and you're not there, like, I'm going to. And it was literally like, as he spins, you, wanna, you need to be hitting him. Yeah. Like, mid-spin, you need to be there. And it's like so hard to do that because you're basically leaving a great shooter completely open. But it's, that's where the trust has to happen, where the rotations will happen. And so it got to the point where we were so early on Giannis's spins that Giannis started, as he spun, he would start to look and half spin. He wasn't even, he was scared to do his spin. That changed the whole series for us. And then we won four straight. He's so used to the driving, putting his head down. And then when he spins, he, he can make that read. If he spins and takes a dribble, he knows what he's doing. Now, if you take away that dribble, literally the entire series changed. I mean, that was just one example of like, man, it's got to be like that. And of course, there were then the Bucks start to make adjustments and they're like, okay, when you get to a spin, half spin, immediately fire the ball right away. And then we just had to rotate. And, and, and that was, again, a whole, you know, trail of chess moves and counters and counters and countering the counter. Yeah, I mean, that's huge because it's basically who can adjust faster. Yeah. At that point, it's like who can be more flexible. And that is... You know, the way we talk, you're talking about right now, that's like from a tactical perspective, like a team oriented thing. But then there's the individual, like technical part of it, like, okay, like knowing how a guy's guarding you, knowing how to make adjustments with different closeouts and that kind of stuff, I think is all like, it's crazy just the levels of like 
from the technical, tactical, even to the psychological and cultural, like, is your GM or your coaching staff, like, are they empowering you? Do you feel supported? And then there's just so many factors that go into performance that I think people, people see the game. They're like, dude, this guy's getting paid millions of dollars. Just why can't he freaking just hit the shot? Yeah. And it's like, okay. So, so yes, but there's a little bit more to that <laughs> that I, I think people don't realize. There's so much more to it. I mean, I just wish the average fan could like just be in a locker room or be in the body of like an NBA athlete just for one game. Like people are like, it's an open shot. It's like, dude, if you were like where, like in that spot shot situation where you had a wide open catch and shoot, like you would crap your pants with that type of pressure. Like you have to build yourself. Why do, why is playoff experience important? They're like, these are people who have been playing like, they're the best in high school, the best in college, they're used to everybody watching them, and then they get to pros and you still need more experience. Why? Because you have to learn how to deal with the pressure. I mean, it's like, I swear, like fans, and that's the thing for me, like, you know this, like, when I was first starting out as a rookie at Golden State, and even in Insanity, you and other people would roast me. You're like, dude, during interviews, it's like, Jeremy, why are you sweating so hard? Why are you stuttering? You don't even know what you're doing. Like, you don't even know what you're saying. Like, what is wrong with you? It's just a question. <laughs> just answer the question. I was like, oh, really? And then finally, I would have my boys be in some of the interviews or the documentaries. And, and you guys were way worse than me. And you guys were like, <sighs> literally like, and it was just like, even just a simple interview and the pressure of that, like, you guys didn't even know how to handle that, and neither did I, right? And so there's this acclimation process. By, by, by the time you get into the playoffs, like an average fan jumping in there, dude, this is, I, I cannot, I, I, I didn't imagine, like I got 12,000 people and millions of people. If I miss this shot, I'm going to go on my social media and everyone's going to crush me for it. Like it, you just can't recreate that. Yeah, definitely. So going into playoff experiences, uh, I believe you've been playoff four times? Twice Shoot. with the Rockets, once with Charlotte, and once Toronto. Yeah. Sounds about right. Thinking back to when Dame hit that shot, I remember, if I recall correctly, that you were having a really good game against him. And basically, can you walk us through maybe the emotions that you remember with that playoff experience? And then um, I can also share my deflated emotions after <laughs> after he hit that shot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, anything you remember from there and, and just about that, that series and that sequence, man, there's so many stories just with that, with that series itself. I'm going to try not to take too much time. Um, Ooh, okay. Let me think about that shot because at this time you were my roommate in Houston. So yeah. you, you know, you knew everything that I was going through. Um, but that specific shot, I was so pissed that I got subbed out. Because I guarded Damian Lillard during that fourth quarter, and prior to that shot, he had not scored a single point on me for the entire fourth quarter. Not one point. And then I get subbed out. And keep in mind, Damian Lillard is Damian Lillard. He's a stud. So he's like been roasting us all series. And so... I was like, okay, you can't get better. You can't play better defense. I'm not saying that I could do that in the long term, but for that stretch, I was doing great. Then I get subbed out, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? And it's hilarious because we get subbed out, and then we're in the timeout, and Mikhail is like, okay, this is going to be our coverage. And then James Harden goes, no, 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 let's, let's try to switch instead. And then... Mikhail's like, ah, oh. and then there's this like awkward uncertainty. And then we break the timeout. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Timeout, like, wait, which one are we doing? Are we chasing over? Are we switching? And if you watch the play, you can go back and watch. You can see James Harden and Chandler Parsons like talking as the play is about to start, trying to figure out like, wait, what are we doing? Are we switching? Are we staying? And then even Damian Lillard has come out and said this in an interview. He was like, the play wasn't actually for me to do that, but I saw them talking and I just broke the play and I just went off and chased the ball and then he hit the shot. And it was like, dude, when he made it, oh, the, the level of anger that I had. Because 
oh man, it was just like, are, I was like, are you kidding me? This is how we're gonna lose? And and I just felt like, man, if we won that, which we should have, if we won that and just got that stop, we win game six, we go back to Houston with the momentum in game seven. I'm like, there's no way, there's no way we're gonna lose. And so to me, it was like, I was just so angry because it felt like there was like a miscommunication or this awkwardness and I, and I felt like we deserved to win. Not only that, I had a really bad turnover when one of the earlier games that ended up, which is why we lost one of those early games. I think it was game three. Um, and, and so I was like really upset and I really wanted to win that series. And so um, anyways, that's what happened. And so for me getting subbed out and having to watch from the sidelines, I was just, I was irate. Yeah, I think for me, I was, I was watching that game with like, um, some house church people in Houston. And when that, when you hit that shot, I was just like, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but was that the game before where like he, you turned the ball over like in the backcourt or where it got so front? That was that, a different that game. Was game. I think that, oh no, no, that was game four. Okay. I think that was game four. And then because of that turnover, we lost and we we're down three, one. Then we went back to Houston, and I had my career playoff high. And I remember we were game five in Houston. They started booing me in the beginning, and then I had it, my career playoff high. And by the end, they were cheering, and I was like, "Yeah, go away." Clutch, clutch fans were not uh, not the biggest fans of us, but um, I think for me, just yeah, when he hit that shot, I had this this feeling inside that our time in Houston was over, and it was such a sad moment for me because I felt like. You know, by year two, we were kind of getting used to living there. Um, you know, we had our spot in downtown Houston and got used to living um, there. And everything felt like pretty good, like with the team. And, and I don't know. I just had that feeling that <laughs> like once it was, once that shot went and I was like, oh, I looked around at my friends. and I was just like, this will be the last time <laughs> we're here. You did call that. I remember you calling that and being like, dude, like it just. I just don't see us coming back next season. I, I, I just feel it. And, I, and, and you're, you're right. I ended up getting traded to the Lakers. Um, and, you know, despite whatever they were telling us, and, and you know, that's just the way the business goes. Um, I mean, the, the business is they're never going to tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the so they're just going to they're going to tell you the opposite um, just in case things fall through. Um, but, you know, obviously, you know, business is business. And, and that was that. So, I mean, that brings us to, that was a very nice segue, that brings us to the Lakers year. Um, so there's two things that, you know, like I was thinking back to the Lakers year is uh, that when we first got to L.A., I believe Kobe asked you to train, um, if you wanted to go down and, and train with him for, for that week. And it's pretty, it was pretty funny because I remember Jeremy getting that text and then me asking Jeremy, like, who who does Kobe train with? Like who's who who works him out? And, he, and Jeremy's like, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Like let me text him. And you texted Kobe, and he was like, I don't need no trainer. I know my game better than anyone else. And then you read me that answer, and I was like, Yeah, that makes that makes the most sense. <laughs> so can you take us back to maybe your memories, and I'll share mine as well of like that week of training. I think it was down in Irvine. Um, and what you remember from there? Well, I, I remember, you know, at that time, because of Lynn's sanity, um, I got a second phone. And this phone was, like, super private, my number. Like, everyone else had my other number, but nobody had this number. Like, only my family, basically, and my closest friends. Then I get an unknown message on my private number. And it's like, hey, you want to work out with me next week at 6 a.m. or 5.45 a.m.? And then it was like KB, and I'm like, <laughs> KB. I literally looked at my family. And I was like, who's? Why do I have an unknown number? And who's KB? You know, because for me, I'm like KB. When I think of KB, I immediately thought of Kenny Blakeney, my mm -hmm. assistant coach at Harvard. I'm like, he's not. Why would he ask me to work out? And he has my number. Like, I'm like KB. I'm like, oh shoot. I think this is. I think this is Kobe Bryant. You know, because I had just gotten traded. I was like. Okay, I think this is Kobe. And how did he get this number? Kobe? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, uh, KB, are you talking about Kobe Bryant? Um, so, anyways, and I asked him like, "Who's your trainer?" He's like, "I don't need a trainer. I don't know what you know like, exactly what you said." And so, we get there, and I'm just like, "Okay, like I'm like, dude, 
we're starting at 6 a.m., but I, I, we're, we're an hour away. In Santa Monica. We got to drive an hour. So I'm like, all right, we got to get up at like 4.45, get there a little bit early. And so we get there, and I'm like, I got to be ready for this workout and all this stuff. And I'm like hyping up in my own mind. I'm like, this is my new teammate. Like, I had two rough years in Houston. I'm going to reestablish myself. And I just remember, like, he basically just had like three or four rebounders, and he was just in his mind. It literally was like um, the only other experience I could sit explain is when I would film the music video with Jay Chow. When I filmed the music video with Jay Chow, who's like one of the top musicians in Asia of all time, Jay Chow didn't have a producer. He was his own producer. And he was literally like thinking through, you could see it was like this mastermind at work. And he was like, he would always do this. And he would always like figure things out. And, and that's what it's like working out with Kobe. Kobe, you could see his mind processing. And he was like, he was looking and you could see him visualizing. And he was like, all right, let me, he's like, hold on. He's like, we're going to work on this. Two dribbles this way. You get cut off. We're going to spin back this way. Now we're going to spin back. Someone's going to help and reach. And I want you to bring the ball around so that he can't strip it. And I want you to go into a jump shot. Every single thing was like, it was like this, it was like happening live, but there was no one on the court. But he was visualizing all of it. And so it was just one of those things where it was just like, man, the level of detail that he puts into his workouts, you could just tell it was at another level. Um, and, and it was just like a simple drill, like two dribbles here, counter, pull-up jumper. He would do like five variations. And I remember there was one of the workouts we did. It was two and a half hours. You almost fell asleep. Like you were there at every single one of the workouts. It was two and a half hours, and he didn't let us drink water once. And it was just like we were just drilling mid-range for two and a half hours, no water. And he was just like so focused. And I was just like, can the man get some water? I'm parched. <laughs> you know what's so funny about... Yeah. Okay, so I did make a post about this, but yes, those were the probably the most boring workouts I had ever watched. I was like super hyped too to watch those workouts, and it was just like one dribble baseline, fade away. One dribble to the middle, fade away. One dribble to the baseline, fake spin, back to the baseline over and over again for like two hours. But the funny story that I remember was, I think it was Wednesday of that week, Kobe says that it's we're just working on defense. No, I don't even think, I don't even know if he said that. He, <laughs> we just showed up and, <laughs> and he's like, all right, we're going to do a little differently. I was like, uh, okay, I'm definitely down for different because yesterday was two and a half hours of mid-range pull-ups with no water. So yeah, let's do something different. I was like, it can't get worse because I'm like, I don't shoot mid-range and I'm not, uh, you know, back to the basket. I'm not an ISO player. Like this is horrible, um, you know, for my game. And so he's like, we're going to do things different. At that time, T-Mac was put, like trying to make a comeback. So T-Mac was working out with us as well. And Wesley Johnson. And Wesley Johnson. So it was me, Kobe. T Mac and Wesley Johnson, and we did 50 minutes. We did 50 minutes of defense. We didn't touch the ball. We didn't touch the ball. Like it was defensive stance, closeouts, turning your hips, like full court slides, like for 50 minutes. And then at the end, he's like, All right, everyone make 10 uh, transition threes, and then we're going to call it. And I was just like, what just happened? It was so tiring, but it super changed my mindset because I was like, yeah, why don't we do more of that? Like literally defense is, is half of the basketball game. And I had never really worked on my defense in a skill workout. And he just spent 50 minutes straight. And I was like, that makes so much sense. And so from then on, we incorporated a ton of defense. <laughs> and that's how I became a really good defensive player. Like my last few years in the NBA, I was always the top or one of the top defensive guards on every team that I was on. A big part of that, I give credit to Kobe for re re like challenging and reshaping my perspective on what skill workouts could look like. Yeah. And what was, well, so that first drill he did was, I don't know if you remember, but you start on the baseline, you slide all the way to where the pain is, you sprint forward to the elbow, slide over, back pedal, then slide to the other corner, sprint all the way down to the other court and just do that. And you guys did like five rounds of that. And I was just like, 
oh, it's, it's a good warm up. It's, it's a warm up. Like 15 minutes later, I was like, okay. But the funniest thing, well, it's, it's not that funny, but what I found interesting was at the end of the season, I remember you being like, man, I never saw him do that again. <laughs> You're like, was that just for show? Like, I know, that, that's been, I mean, he had, he was injured, obviously, but I just thought that was so funny. And we're like, oh man, maybe he just did that for, for that week of training. But the other thing I remember too is that we wanted to outwork him. Like, so, I mean, at this point, Kobe was what, 35, I believe? 35 or 36 coming off of back to back injuries, like really bad injuries. Yeah. So this is not like the same exact same Kobe as you know we grew up maybe hearing about so I remember we would finish workouts two hours with him drink some water because Jeremy's parched and then do another skill workout like no no, we would go lift we could lift at there and do another skill workout and and then we would do another workout after and I just remember us being like hmm we worked out (laughs) I mean granted it was just for a week but I was like yeah we worked we worked out harder than Kobe this week (laughs) and being so happy of it. I mean, obviously it's a cumulative work of lifetime, but I just thought that was, that was pretty funny. We're like, no, we're going to come before him and leave after him. (laughs) Yeah, No, I do remember that because, you know, we would come in early and we get there at 545, 6. We would start at 6. Depending on the day, we would end, you know, from 6 to 7 or 6 to 8 or whatever it was. And so whatever, however long he budgeted his workout, after that, he would go get treatment and he'd go get his massage and all this stuff. And that'd be like an hour, hour and a half. Within that hour, I would lift. And then after that, I'd be back on the court. By the time he finished his treatment, he would come back out and I would be doing my third workout of the day. And I remember thinking like, yo, he doesn't work that hard. Like the legend isn't like, <laughs> the legend isn't real. Like this is a whole I myth. Have to cut this part. <laughs> no, we're telling this. And I'm like, I literally am working out three times longer than him. And I remember thinking at that time, I was like, dude, like, <laughs> I work way harder than Kobe. But I didn't realize that like, he was ten years older than me. So now that I'm 33, I'm thinking like, would I ever, you know, in three years I'll be 36, like. Would I ever do that? And it was just like, your body can't. Like, it's not that he, like when he was younger, I'm sure he did this, the crazy stuff I was doing when I was younger, just like insane hours. Like, but your body can't, at a certain point, it's diminishing returns. And I feel like what Kobe was also showing me was like, work smart. Because working hard is ingrained in my personality. It's ingrained in his personality. Like me and him have this like addictive, obsessive personality where we will overwork ourselves. I mean, Josh, Jaywa has story after story of how I've worked myself to the point of like almost fainting. I've worked my worked myself to the point of like getting like physically ill for days, like just like pushing myself beyond human limits and just like the the aftermath and the crash of that and like or getting hurt or different things of just like how intense my training was like we have story after story after story and Kobe was showing me that like as you get older you can't be crazy about that you have to get your work in and work smart and be efficient and then get off and rest because otherwise you're going to burn out or you're going to get hurt um, so again, I mean, shoot, I did outwork Kobe, but now that I'm like older in my age, I'm like, okay, what he was doing makes total sense. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with that, which, you know, brings me to my next point of, you know, this is our 11th off season together. I would like to, you know, maybe talk the fans or people watching this through that journey of like what year one was like, or, you know, the first couple of years to, you know, the last couple of years, because, You've evolved as a player. I've evolved as a trainer, um, and maybe I can I can start with that. Is is when we first were working out. I believe we were going, we were lifting four days a week, and then going twice a day, uh, with them both being around an hour and a half. Honestly, they're both so it was about three hours a day, and at first we didn't take that initial Thursday off. I think we were going just like straight six six days a week, and I think Saturday maybe we did like one workout instead of two, but that was like the only day. So I remember early on that schedule being like 
probably the most brutal, brutal training schedule. And I mean, it made a lot of sense. You know, when I think of back back then, I was like, oh, this is what made you like, this is people are always like, how did he get there? What's different about him? And I'm like, yes, he's very talented, high IQ, very athletic, but also he just, he just plain out works everyone else as well as having all those other things. Um, and I can share some more of my thoughts, but yeah, I'm interested to hear like what you remember about those times and what you think about now. Yeah. I mean, so what Jay was describing is basically Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I would have an hour and a half lift, an hour and a half shooting workout and an hour and a half skill workout. Like, and we're again, like intense, intense. And then Wednesday and Saturday would be a, no lift and we would go one or two times on the court. Like <laughs> it was an insane schedule. Um, and I think early on we were so hungry as a trainer and a trainee that we were just like, you know, we're just putting in hours and, 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 and we're just outworking everybody. I think the evolution came as I started to, you know, there were times when I almost fainted. There were times when I would get so dizzy that I would have to like, literally like I couldn't stand up. And like, there were times when I would get hurt. There were times when I would sleep for 12 hours for like three straight days because like I was at such fatigue, but I was like, it doesn't matter. Like fight through it. You got like, you got to get better. Like next season is going to be a great season. And I think for you, you were challenging me and yourself. Like how can we work more efficiently? How can we work smarter? This doesn't seem like a sustainable long term. So not early on though. I was like, let's get it. <laughs> yeah. Early on we were like, let's get it. And it was just like, you were taking pads and you're beating me and you're like taking sticks and you're whacking me on the head while I was trying to finish. And like, I'm short. <laughs> and so I think like at the, at that time, yeah. I mean, I think for, for you is just a huge evolution of even just the weight room philosophy, everything that we did, it didn't have to be max effort, every single rep, every single time, that's not sustainable. Um, and so now we've, we've changed a lot. And I think the one, the biggest thing I'll give you credit for is early on, you know, Jay Wild wasn't like, like he went to school, he got his law degree. He had just gotten his law degree. And I was like, Hey, you want to work for me full time as a trainer? <laughs> He's like, I just got my law degree. What are my parents are going to kill me? I was like, yeah, it's cool. I mean, uh, are you, you know, are you paying me? <laughs> <laughs> you can always go back to law. <laughs> and so he comes on, but I'm, my whole point is there's this whole concept of Jaywa not feeling like, like, oh, there's this, I have to learn. I, I'm not, I'm not as, I, I, I don't necessarily feel like I belong as a trainer just yet. And so as you came into your own and became more confident and you started doing more certifications, taking more classes, you started working with every NBA team. You started understanding my game more, digesting and breaking down film year after year after year. There was a certain point where it's like you're growing, 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 and you kind of turn the corner and brace and you're like, no, like this is my show. Like I know what I'm doing. Like we're doing it this way. And for me, that was really helpful to see that progression. And then for me, it was like, hey, with your confidence and leadership, I can follow behind that. And I think that's why like, I've had huge progress. My last two seasons of basketball have been my two best seasons shooting in terms of like my highest percentages from three, all the, you know, like the most amount of floaters, the most times I've gone left, like all the stuff that we've been working on is actually really like, it's, it's, you can see direct like statistical proof that all this stuff is translating over. And so um, I give you a lot of credit for what you've done with my game for sure. Yeah, and I, I think for me, if I were to be brutally honest, I didn't deserve to be Jeremy's trainer early on. Like I, I didn't know enough, I wasn't, and it was big on him to kind of trust me with this training. I think maybe the one thing that Jeremy saw in me was just like, kind of a doggedness to want to learn and he'll be like yeah he doesn't know it all but he'll f like he'll find a way and that's kind of been like my personality most of my life is like not the smartest guy not the fastest but like I will figure out what I don't know and and, tr and find a way and so I think over the years it's taken a while for me to see that that how unqualified or how bad I was early on and you know in a way like, it makes me sad because I'm like, dang, maybe if Jeremy had a better trainer early on, like, we wouldn't, 
you know, he'd be, you know, I don't know, still in league. Everything happens for a reason, so it's like not the end of the world. But having said that, yeah, I think like just so much in in your way of how you take care of your body and how you think of things. And um, also just, I realized for a long time, it's like, it's more important for me to learn from you too, because it's like, dude, you're all on the NBA teams. You're in the meetings. You know more than any other trainer, in my opinion, does in terms of like the actual game of basketball. Like, That's Kobe's philosophy, right? It's like LeBron. You, you, you think you know more about basketball than LeBron does or like these guys? It's like, no. Maybe like from like a technical, like how to execute, but just from a game standpoint. So that also came with the mindset shift on me to be like, I started asking a lot more questions. Yeah. Like, hey, what do you see on this coverage? Hey, what do you think? Hey, what do you think about this drill? what do you struggle with like in yesterday's pickup with? And I was like, and I think it came to me when you had to do some of your workouts alone or you were like, Hey, can I lead some of this workout? And I would just watch how you, you would do your own workouts. And I'd be like, Oh wow. We don't, you think pretty differently in certain regards for me. And I was like, Oh, I have actually a lot to learn. So I found that tremendously helpful. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just the evolution, you know, again, like, because I felt like, that's the reason why I really appreciated Kobe because I felt like when I work out, it's the same thing. Like I'm, I'm, I'm seeing things play out in my mind, but sometimes I, I don't express it verbally to everyone around me. So when I, when you would give me drills or be, or I'd be like, can I work on this? Or can I lead this part of the workout? To me, it was like, I was recreating game situations in my mind. And it's like this artistry that like I could get lost in and, and I think that ultimately breeds the creativity and then the spontaneity and just the pure artistry that basketball requires, the fluidity of it. And um, but I think what you've done is you've pieced together other parts that I, you know, I'm an expert at basketball, f- five on five, X's and O's. Like I would trust myself more than pretty much almost anybody in the world because I feel like I know that much about the game. But you pieced together so much other stuff. You gave me a third party perspective of being able to watch like movement mechanics or on my jump shot when the ball was too far out or when my knee would cave in or even injury prevention, a lot of stuff in the weight room or how to transfer stuff from the weight room into, you know, like there was just so much that I couldn't, that I was not an expert at. So I had my like s- focused lane, but you really rounded out everything else. That's why like you know, for a long time, I couldn't even stop and shoot a, uh, I couldn't even shoot a pull up going to my left, stopping on my right foot because my knee was so messed up. Mm. And then you like help me, you know, there's just so much to my game, even spin moves. When I tried to spin, when I used to spin, I would just fall over. And it wasn't until you like really taught me and broke it down and we worked on it in the weight room and we worked on D cells and we worked on all this stuff that led to it. And so, um, again, it's been, uh, like such a partnership over the years, but, uh, man, you know, uh, I, the reason why I felt like I believed in you was like, for me growing up, it was always like, oh, he doesn't, his, his jump shot or his whatever might not be as good as so-and-so. Or to be honest, a lot of it was just like, he's Asian. He doesn't look the part. But I felt like everybody always overlooked like the dog inside of me. Like, mm-hmm. dude, it doesn't matter what the obstacle is. If you give me time, I will find a way to overcome this obstacle. Like, Just, I was like, I don't need to be the strongest fighter in the arena, but if you put me in the arena and you leave me in there long enough, I will figure it out and I will be the best. Like that was my mentality growing up. And so I felt like you had that of like, okay, you might not be the best trainer, the most knowledgeable today, but if I put you in the arena and give you that chance, you'll figure it out. And I feel like that's what you did. And I feel like that's what I've, I mean, I've thrived off of that my whole career is like, dude, just get me in the arena, put me against people better than me and talk to me in two years and they won't be better than me. Yeah. I I think it's really, he saw me play Halo and saw the improvement (laughs) over the years on Xbox. We were nice in Halo. (laughs) We were nice in college. (laughs) Yeah, he was actually doubles. way better than me. Yeah. But <laughs> Jeremy was annoyed because I would actually practice like set up situations and do live simulations with Halo. And he's like, yo, let's just play. <laughs> he was like, out here <laughs> shouting terminology. He's like, bro, the, the gun respawns every two minutes in the green room. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it's like, dude, can I just, I'm just trying it's just, to. There's just different levels of preparation. <laughs> I'm just okay? trying so, to have fun with my homies. Um, <laughs> I will say one thing, and I give you a ton of credit for, I think you were able to improve during those years also was 
because of what you shared, which is intent and visualization. Even if the drills and the sequencing weren't the most optimal, I think your innate ability to feel the game, to see the game. And I started noticing it more in the middle of your career where I could just tell your eyes would glaze, not glaze over like you weren't hearing me, but I could just tell like you would immerse yourself in the moment. And so having said that, like, I think that's really important that you could have the best drills in the world, but if you're not building in the intent, obviously the best drills should build in intent and force you to have intent like today, like the drill we did today. But having said that, I think you were able to make the most out of um, the subpar drills that we did earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you're, giving, you're, you're shooting yourself down too much, but no, there are times when I work out and literally like what people are saying to me, I'm not, I mean, you see it, you, you talk about my eyes glaze over. It's like, I, I'm literally in a different world. And I'm thinking something else and I'm not, and I'm just like, okay, this is a drill, but this is like, what does the drill look like? And I'll envision different types of defenders and like different situations that are happening, different scenarios. And then I'll work on different moves and I'll be like, you know, and so there's just this like, yeah, it's like, I literally go to a different place sometimes and you can see it like where you're talking to me and I'm just like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can see those moments. I'm like, oh, he's so locked in. Um, <laughs> I just, just segueing a little bit, uh, you know, due to time's sake, we'll probably do another episode at some point, but craziest memory, craziest memory in the CBA. Um, you know, you spent two seasons over there and then maybe craziest memory in the NBA. It doesn't have to be like towards play, but just like what, what sticks out to you, um, the most, and you can exclude insanity or you can include insanity up to you. Yeah. And I you can do multiple ones. If you want. Craziest moment in a CBA. Um, I would say two two things come to mind. One was when we were in Tongshi and we were playing, and I think I we I had thirty three that game, but we lost, and I was so pissed that we lost. <laughs> like they hit a buzzer beater because we blew a defensive coverage, yeah. and I was so mad at my teammate. <laughs> because I had hit the shot right before with five seconds and that would have been the game winner. And then we come back to the hotel and it's literally like, I couldn't even make it to the hotel elevator because the fans were so excited and they were just mobbing me. And I was like, I was so angry and I didn't want to, I wanted to punch everybody and be like, get away from me. <laughs> but I was just like, dude, these fans are just so over the top. And like, literally I was like getting bounced around. They were like crowding in. They were just pushing me, everyone pushing from all these different angles. And I was like literally bouncing around and you were clearing away. You're like, get out the way, open that elevator. And, like, and that to me was just like the, the fan energy. Um, that was one of the stories where I was just like, dude, that's insane. Like we just lost. Did you guys see? We just lost. Like, why are you still rooting for me? You know, it's kind of what I was thinking. Like, I don't deserve this. Um, the second one I would say is like when we were just in the playoffs at that time, you had been promoted um, and you were uh, second, you were third in command, but you're the second top assistant coach. And I was just like, dude, who would have thought? Like we used to like take the subway and do like crazy workouts in like the rec center of our colleges. And now... I'm like a franchise player competing for the play in the playoffs. And you're like my assistant coach. Like, I just remember in that moment, just like, man, God has taken us so far. The game of basketball can do amazing things. And it was just like, we were just two, two kids who didn't know it, who just, you know, wanted to hoop and like, look at how far the journey has taken us. So that was my CBA stories. I think my craziest moment in the NBA had to have been the Toronto Raptors championship party. I mean, I've never seen this many people. Like, everywhere you go, just, if you look out into the horizon, as far as you can, it's just little heads, heads, like just people, 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 people. It was just, I could share it and talk about it, but it doesn't do it justice. You had to have been there. You had to have been there to understand the energy. Like we would be going by skyscrapers and every single window in the skyscraper, everyone would be holding signs. Like people were on top of stoplights. Like I don't even know how you get up there. I'm talking about stoplights like, like 30 to 50 feet above the ground. They're like sitting on these stoplights. Like how do you get up there? Like how, it, you had to be like some world-class like, I don't know, pole climber or whatever to be able to, you know, I'm just like, this is insane, man. Yeah. I mean, 
responding to the Toronto thing, I, I think that was probably the most insane thing. I don't think I've seen that many people like in one place in my life. And I just remember thinking this is like a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to see that. And, and just that whole sequence of events, like my, my greatest regret is not coming out to that, that final game and, and being there for, uh, to be and celebrate after like, you know, so many years in the NBA. Um, and then I guess for me, my, like the, the two things that stuck out with me in, in the CBA was, well, the, the first memory was that when we were in the playoff bubble, um, I think half the teams were staying in the same hotel. So imagine there's only two elevators in this hotel and you have 10 CBA teams with seven footers and six eleven, And then we go to the game at the same time and we come home at the same time and we eat in the same diner, in the same cafeteria. So I just remember that being like the funniest thing that you're about to go to war against these teams. And like you get in the elevator and all the coaches are like, kind of like bowing to each other and like, like players like, like saying what's up and like and then having to if you like lost or got in a fight in the game like having to go into the cafeteria i was just like dude this is like the craziest setup of all time and like players purposely like waiting for like like oh you, you go first like we don't want to be in that ele- <laughs> yeah. elevator with you i just thought that was insane and my second memory was just like that final shot you missed against Guangdong at the buzzer i like I was sitting next to Yen, who was our video coordinator, and I was like, this shot is... There was a lot of miracles that I felt like had happened that season. I just was so confident that shot went in, like was going to go in, and when it hit the front of the room, I just remember being like in such disbelief. But, you know, in hindsight, it was it was probably the craziest ride, and I think it's so valuable that we had spent time. Like we had been to China maybe like nine, eight, nine years in a row before that, but nothing, I think, prepared us for living over there and experiencing the CBA more than you playing over there. And I think that was like so valuable to me and that gave me a new appreciation and, and like total new insight into like what life is like over there. I don't know if you feel the same way. Oh yeah. I mean, just being immersed there is just like a whole different, whole different world. And, um, but the fact that we got to go through it together, I remember after game two of that playoff series, I was so tired. I was getting beat up. I mean, I was so beat up that I had to go to the hospital after that playoff series the next morning. My knee, I couldn't bend my my knee past like 90 degrees for like three weeks after that series. I had so many like s- small injuries. Like I was so messed up from that. And I remember after game two, I came off the court and I just put my, my arm over you and I was just like, dude, just carry me. Like I'm that tired. Like just, just just carry me. I can't believe we won that game. And, and just like that experience, like that level of battle intensity, like you can't, you can't recreate that. You don't get that anywhere else. You, you just have to go through it. Mm-hmm. And, and once you go through it, that's why basketball mm-hmm. creates lifelong friends. It's like these memories are like forever solidified. Like when you really go to battle with your, your comrades um, and, and going back to the Toronto Raptors championship party, it just one of the hilarious stories was just like, <laughs> I was so inexperienced with champagne and cigars that like, I was like, dude, we won a championship. I've seen like photos of like people smoking cigars. And I was like, I want to smoke a cigar, but I didn't know how. And they were like trying to teach me and I couldn't even get the thing to like, I couldn't even get the cigar to like light. And I was like, this is too complicated. There's 2 million people out here. Forget the cigar. And I just put the cigar in my pocket because I was like, I literally don't know how to smoke it and I don't have time to actually learn because I keep trying to like, they're like, in, like puff, like get, get the fire going. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what to, what I'm doing. And then spraying champagne, it was the same thing. I was like, I didn't know how to do it. And like you had you and other people had to teach me like, okay, so you shake it up, you pop it and you go like this. And I remember the first couple of bottles that I tried to pop, I was just like, it popped. And then there's like nothing fizzing out. And then finally it would fizz out. And then I would like put my hand over it and then nothing would come out or I would let it go. And then it would just like droop. And it's like, no, you gotta like do it. And I, so the whole, it was just hilarious. Like that whole experience of having my boys there, you guys teaching me how to pop champagne and trying to teach me how to smoke a cigar, seeing 2 million crazy fans going wild. Like, man, that was such a, that was such a fun day. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about Toronto for days. <laughs> it's like the, my, one of my favorite cities. Um, yeah. Just rounding out this, this episode, I think two things that, I think would be tremendously valuable are one, like what advice 
do you give to these upcoming players that are, are trying to make it, um, whether they're Asian American or anyone else who's listening to this podcast, you're trying to make it like what, it, what, it, what, what kind of like stuff did you wish you knew? Obviously, like we talked about load management and all that stuff. The second question, the second thing that I would love you to just, we don't have to go too in depth about is just take it, talking about the psychological perspective, because at some point the technical components of Jeremy's game and the tactical, like he understood the game very well, like the skill was there, but really at the highest levels, it's when everyone, when all things are even it's, it's psychological, right? And it's who it's who can hone in and feel less pressure and feel more comfortable in that high pressured situation. So can you talk about, yeah, one piece of advice and then, the work that you've have made in the psychological aspect? I think it's hard because originally my piece of advice was to hone, <laughs> hone the mind. And then okay, that was sure. your second question. But so let's just talk about the mind first. Like at the pro level, everyone has the skills. Actually, a lot of role players have really good skill, but why do they not become franchise players? Sometimes there's just a huge skill disparity, but in certain situations, it's just the people who really make it and make it big are the ones who just believe themselves a little bit more. I'll never forget like Trey Young, my our rookie year, like Trey Young would like shoot these crazy shots and have these crazy turnovers and everyone would be like, stop doing that. You're losing games for us. Like da 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 And then like literally the next game, he'd just do it again and be like, dude, are you not registering what we're saying to you? But in his mind, he was like, look, None of you guys know what I'm capable of. Like, this is a good shot for me. This is a good play for me. Like, you know, and it was almost like he couldn't hear what other people were saying. And to me, it was like, to me, I actually respected it. Other people saw it as like extreme arrogance. This kid doesn't know what he's doing. He's been doing it this, his, this way his whole life. A part of that was true, but there's another part that I really, really respected and admired was just like, he's so confident and he knows his game so well that like even when the entire team and the world is telling him this is not a good shot or this is you can't do this he was like i can i can i can and i will and i will and i will and that's why year 2 year 3 year 4 those same shots that he was missing oh, he started to make but yeah. he knew before the shots were going in he knew this was a good shot for me i mean that's just an example of tremendous psychological like confidence and and i think that's super important so you could skill work all you want but if you don't actually believe like what's the point in having a good shot if you don't believe you have a good shot you know what i'm saying and so that's a big part of it um i guess my advice so something different other than the mindset i guess another piece of advice i would give young players is man don't spend your whole time comparing i feel like i lost i didn't appreciate who i was and I didn't enjoy the journey because I spent too much time comparing myself to other players. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I say that is because now, like everyone's on Instagram trying to have like the flashier, cooler, cooler trainers and drills and all this. Like I'm trying to get likes and comments and I'm trying to, it's like a comparison game that like when you actually get down to it and you hoop, like, do you think that this stuff is going to be what makes you win or lose or what makes you excel or become better than the person that is lined up across from you? Like, stop comparing. Stay in your lane. Don't be on social media all the time trying to figure out the newest. Like, figure out what you want. Figure out who you are as a player. Figure out what you want to improve on. Just one or two things and then go for it. Tune out the outside noise. You don't even have to post all this stuff. Like, you can post some of it. But just don't listen to all the outside noise about the social medias and da, 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 da. like social media ha is like helpful in some ways, but it can be really detrimental for a young player if you don't know how to use it and absorb it appropriately. And then just finally or lastly, can you share about how you improve? Because a lot of people probably are listening and are like, dude, yeah, of course I know I want to be psychologically more robust or I need to improve it, but don't really know how. And actually early on, you didn't know how either. So maybe what are some small things that people that helped you that you can, you know, you don't have to give advice, but what worked for you to help you shore up, you know, that component of, of your mind? Um, okay. I'll give a small example. Um, my whole life, especially as a pro, people were saying like, Oh, he can't shoot. He can't shoot. 
So what I tell myself, oh, I, I'm not a great shooter. I'm not a great shooter. And that's all. And, and I was just like, yeah, like, and my coaches would be like, dude, if you hit, if you hit a, f- a few, if you get hot, like, we know you can take over a game. We'll roll with you. But if you don't, like, then it's not your night. And I let what they tell, told me and the way they would use me in a game, I let that become the narrative that I told myself. And then it's not until I found a sports psychologist and my agent, Roger Montgomery. Um, so Mono, you know, Watson was like my sports psychologist and Roger Montgomery is my agent. And they really like helped me reframe and rewire myself of like, okay, number one, you're a great shooter. Number two, like just because you don't hit a couple doesn't mean that it's not your night because all it takes for you is one shot. And that, you know, and Doc Shepler, who I did a lot of shooting with earlier in my career, was always like, next one's in. But for me, I started to reshape my mindset. And I was like, I had to understand, number one, what is your limiting belief? My limiting belief was I'm not a great shooter. And, and then number two, you had to replace that limiting belief with a new belief. And I had many new beliefs around my shot, but one of them was like, I can make every shot easily. Like to me, that was like a new belief that I need to have. like, I can make every shot in the book very easily. And it wasn't until, and I had to repeat myself, constantly repeat myself. And every time that limiting belief, like you're not a great shooter would come in, I would have to replace that and retell myself the new belief. Like, no, you can make every shot easily. And it wasn't until then that I started to realize that I used to think about shots. Like if I made it, it was a good shot. If I missed, it was a bad shot. And I started to rethink it completely. It was just... If the shot was something I worked on and I knew it was going to go in, it was a good shot, regardless of whether it went in. That's what Trey did, right? Like Trey was like, hey, it didn't go in today. I missed two or three in a row, but it's a good shot for me. Mm -hmm. And so I started defining what a good shot and a bad shot was differently. And I stopped looking at the result. I just was like, hey, this is a shot I've worked on. I know I can make it. I shot it. That's a good shot. And so to me, that was like what really helped me break through as a shooter um, and, and so now this is why, you know, when I went to the G League, I was number one in the G League in shooting efficiency between field goal, three point and free throw. Like I was number one in the entire G League in shooting efficiency. Like it's because I start to believe in myself as a great shooter. So, I mean, that's just one of the examples. But again, to summarize, find what your limiting belief is, figure out what the new belief you want to replace that is with. And then you have to actively execute on that. And of course, I work on my shot, but I also work on my mindset centered around my shot. Yeah, and, and I just think that's so important because so many people work on the technical and just shoot and grind and go to the gym and they watch film, but it just doesn't stick because they have limiting the beliefs. Like once you get in, it doesn't matter how good your form is. If you're a little bit nervous or you feel like coach is watching your shoulders, your it's parents, like there's a little bit of a hitch in your shot or you miss the first two shots and coaches like, don't shoot that. It's not a good shot. Like now you're thinking about it. And that's such, that's so different than, Hey, make 10 in a row from the spot. Hey, make 500 shots. Say it's like completely different. So being able to like embed some of the stress into your workouts, but also doing work off the court with your mind, I think is so important. So yeah. I think, um, you know, me and Jeremy probably could talk for, five more hours but you know like i think this is a great start if you guys find this content interesting leave a comment let us know hopefully um you know we're going to do some more of these in the future and maybe talk about more personal things i know today was much more basketball oriented but we're just trying to do that because nba playoffs are going on and and to be able to talk about your experiences i think are pretty important do you have any parting words my only parting word is uh man like uh it's so rare. I feel like it's so rare that a trainer is willing to give so much of how he thinks. And it's like his trade secrets, right? Like I'm not even willing to give you guys all my secrets about my game and what, you know, cause I don't want everyone to know, like, uh, but Josh has been really willing to do that. So definitely go follow him on Instagram. It's at coach Josh fan, but basically he's been generous enough to be like, look, I'm going to, share a lot of what I'm learning with the world. A big part of that, he wants to help the next generation of hoopers, um, even if it means he gives away some of his trade secrets. So that's my biggest thing is like, this opportunity does not come, it does not grow on trees. You, you, don't, you don't get to learn this much from you know, some of the best. So um, definitely check it out, uh, follow him, and, uh, and we'll have a lot of content on there.